visually impaired and totally blind kids. And so there was a hi double hierarchy in that school. One was how, how old you were, so you were 12 to 18, and one was how much you could see. And I found myself at the bottom of both of those hierarchies. I couldn't see anything and I was 12. So I didn't bother about it, I still played football, and uh, I think I scored my first goal with a ball, let's be polite, it hit my hip and went into the goal. And uh, as a natural striker, of course, I claimed it, and uh, that was my uh, contribution to the game. But as I carried on playing, I got more and more involved, got more and more touches, became more and more important within the team context, and you know, I played hours upon hours upon hours of football, probably more than that than I should have, should have probably studied a little bit more actually. But, um, but just got my, what you call those 10,000 hours of preparation during that time, in a very difficult circumstances, but of course, eventually I rose to the sort of top of that hierarchy and was able to, um, to dominate the games and really you know, use those skills to, to what you saw on the, on, on the thing there. But the interesting thing for your perspective maybe is that I wasn't, and it wasn't until I was 25 years old that I actually got formally coached to play football. And that was when a lot of people came together around the world to find one format of playing blind football, which you see there, based on futsal, 40 metres by 20 pitch, four outfield players, one goalkeeper, goalkeeper fully sighted. I think it's only fair when the ball's travelling at you at 85 miles an hour. It's probably best you can see it. Uh, and uh, the outfield players, are, as I say, are, are all um, totally blind. And I played my first game for England and Great Britain uh, in, in Spain in 1996 in, uh, in Madrid and then went on to play 144 times for my country uh, thereafter. But at that time there were two criteria. One was you, could, uh, you were good enough and two that you, you, were, you could afford to go. Uh, and, and that clearly needed to change, but that was only going to change over a long period of on-field on success and off-field success. And so we carried on in that way through a European Championships in Spain and then a World Championships in Brazil and then a European Championships in, in Portugal where I got my first golden boot. Uh, for scoring nine goals in that tournament. And then in 2000, the FA came along and they said, you know what, we realise that football has actually been pretty exclusive. It's a game that's for everybody, disabled, elderly, young, everyone. So they actually started to fund us and they gave us the, the, the coaching and the kit and, and everything. And the World Championships in 2000, that was the first time we played in the proper embroidered England kit and were truly part of the FA football family. And that carried on right until uh, we were, got the opportunity to play, play football as a Paralympic sport. And in 2007, we were in the European Championships uh, looking to qualify for the 2008 Paralympics. And we found ourselves in one of those situations in life, and you probably felt this earlier in the year when you found out about your, your funding and all the difficult decisions you had to make. 54 seconds to go in a game against Italy, we were 1-0 down. If we didn't draw the game, we were out. That was it, it finished. Uh, 54 seconds to go, I, for one of the few times in my life, decided I was being marked by two players. I backheeled the ball to someone else, rather than trying to be selfish and use it myself as a striker. Backheeled across the box, good friend of mine from school, Darren Harris, controlled it, smashed it past the Italian goalkeeper. We drew the game, we won our semi-final and we qualified for Beijing. Now in those moments, 54 seconds was the difference between going out and the whole kind of project falling apart and, get, and carrying on and, being, and, and getting that success, going to Beijing and then building through to London. And having played in 2008 in Beijing, I told my wife before I left these shores that this was my last tournament, 37 years old, time to give up and carry on my banking career where I work with, uh, with Clive Dell and St Albans. And uh, of course that was until I, I scored the winner in the 5th-6 playoff and I said to myself, <laughs> it can't end here. <laughs> so I came off the pitch and the interviewer said to me uh, from the BBC, so yeah, that's it now, you're hanging up your boots. I said, well actually, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> and then realised that live on television, you know, I now had a reason to explain to my wife uh, that I changed my mind. Because four years, you know, what I would tell you is I've got a full-time career um, and I was between uh, Beijing and London, I was training six days a week. So two times six in the morning, two times six o'clock at night, uh, for two hours each time, and then two times at home. So I gave myself Wednesdays off from training, working Monday to Friday. And of course, the people that suffer in that arrangement are, are, are family. Uh, because, you know, your work, your work is putting obligations on you, your sport is putting obligations on you. And of course, the family time, I've got two young boys, uh, and that's what misses out. And don't let any athlete ever tell you that they make sacrifices, because they don't. They make choices. And uh, the people around them make enormous sacrifice. And it's worth asking yourself from time to time, is how many, how many people are making sacrifices on the basis of the choices you're making? And, and, and are you making up for that? And I'm sure I'm trying to do that since I retired. But um, 
within the time we've got, I want to cover a couple of things that are really, uh, really <coughs> relevant. And I think it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, London. After all that training, London Paralympics was really the benchmark. Uh, and I've no doubt that the Rio Paralympics would have been allowed to fail this year in, 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 in real terms had London not been such a benchmark that people live by. Because for me, it was incredible. To receive the torch from Joe Townsend, who was a competing athlete this year in the triathlon, coming off the zip wire from the, from, from the, the, uh, the orbit tower, to come into the stadium and hand me the torch, and then to run through that stadium in front of 80,000 people and millions around the world, and to hand it to Margaret Morn, who, who won the first ever Paralympic medal in 1960 in Rome, and to stand there in the heat of that cauldron and just feel the warmth of that whole the Paralympic movement was the most incredible experience of my life. I did think, you know, what could possibly go wrong with a, a double amputee coming in on a zip wire with a lit torch and handing it to a blind guy <laughs> who's then going to run across a, 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 a whole field festooned with wires and all sorts of things and hand it to a, a, an elderly lady in a wheelchair. You know, I don't have visions of me torching the whole lot. But I'm glad to say it went without a hitch and it was the most incredible experience. I also, of course, you saw me on there scoring the equaliser against Spain in front of four and a half thousand people around a five-a-side pitch in, in, in the Paralympic venues and that was a most incredible moment for our sport because we started from these humble beginnings uh, and what we arrived at was a situation where the stadium was sold out, you know, it could have been sold out three or four times over. We literally had millions watching the game around the world in this country alone and people watching the game in, in offices. In, uh, you know, in bars, in schools, in all sorts of uh, city centre locations. Uh, and the amount of people who got in touch with me and, and, and said, you know, we saw the goal, and it, was, you know, it was just an incredible moment, really, where the sport really came alive. And if you couple the torch experience with that, it really brought blind football home to the mass audience in, in the UK. And the, and the great news was that they appeared to, 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 really, to really love it. And, and of course, for us, we were one of two amateur squads in the, in the London Paralympics. We'd got all the support in terms of the backroom stuff and all the training and all the sports sites and everything else. What we didn't have, it wasn't possible to, to, to play uh, football as a full-time career. You'd be aware that many of the athletes are represented, in fact, almost all the athletes are represented Great Britain in the Paralympics this year. That is their career, that is what they do. They are funded by UK Sport and, uh, to, to do exactly that. And our our job was to get football from this amateur-based, uh, self-funded, you know, borrowed kit of 1996 to a professional team in 2013. And that is what our results in, in London achieved. So we were able to compete with the very best against Argentina and Spain and China, who were all professional squads who won medals. Uh, we remained unbeaten. And whilst we didn't make the medal matches, we proved that as a team we'd come to a level where we were world-class. And on the basis of that, England, for two years every cycle and Great Britain for two years every cycle now has a professional football team based at St George's Park um, and of course that was the moment of course as soon as we started getting paid to play that was the moment when I did retire <laughs> uh, but they were very kind to me they named the changing room after me at St George's Park which is very nice um, and uh, I was a bit concerned it might be just like an outdoor loo or something but it really is a full blooded um, uh, uh, changing room and also I went to stay there with my wife, I was giving a speech at the National F Football Conference up there and I went to stay there with my wife and we walked into the room and uh, it was a big double bed, beautiful room in the Hilton Hotel at St George's Park and over the bed was a huge photograph of me. <laughs> and my wife said that is the last thing I need to see. Pay good money for this room. But I'm just going to want to... Uh, uh, Share with you one more, one more story and then I'll, I'll pull it all together with what I think it means for you guys here today. But, you know, we talk about opportunity and, and for me, you know, I've gone from a position where it's not possible to play football at all as a blind person to being recognised at a national level and, 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 and taking the team with a number of other people from a, this non, this sort of amateur state right through to a professional team who now, you know, being a footballer is a, is a career choice for a, for a blind person in this country. But um, it's a very interesting parallel um, occurred in my life, which just, you know, serendipity gone crazy. But in January 2013, uh, David Bernstein, who was chairman of the Football Association, said, to David, I'd like to recognise your football career by inviting you to be the guest of honour at the FA Cup final in 2013. 
And I was amazed by this. The kind of people who've done this before are, are royalty, secretary generals of the UN, uh, you know, prime ministers, all this kind of stuff. For me, you know, this little kid from Wigan suddenly growing up in the world and finding himself being the guest of honor at Wembley for the FA Cup final was the most incredible thing. But something else incredible happened, which none of us could ever have realized. David uh, Bernstein's team in Manchester City, he used to be chairman of the football club there, and they got to the final. But another team got to the uh, got to the final that year, and it was only Wigan Athletic, my hometown, <laughs> my hometown team, which was the most remarkable story. And it was the most remarkable story because Dave Whelan, who owned uh, Wigan Athletic, he had played in a cup final in 1960 and broken his leg. I mean, taken to hospital, and he was told that not only had he lost the cup final, but his career was over as well. And so he found a different way. He went to put a market store up in, uh, in, in Blackburn, and then he and then he uh, changed that into a shop, and then it changed into a string of shops that gave him the firepower to create the brand JJB Sports, that then gave him the money to buy Wigan Athletic Football Club. And not only did he buy the football club, but he took them from the, the verge of extinction right through to the Premier League. He built them a stadium, and our paths, you know, both being from Wigan, both having an affiliation with Wigan, our paths crossed in the Royal Box at Wembley at that cup final. And, um, and not only were Wigan in the cup final, but Wigan won the cup final <laughs> with an injury time goal against one of the richest clubs in the world. It was the most unlikely story. And I remember going down the queue of players when we were shaking hands and I was trying to be all professional. And Paul Scharner, who's a crazy Austrian from Wigan who was playing at the time, said to me, Ah, you're from Wigan. We'll definitely win now. <laughs> and, um, I, I, I wish I could have shared his confidence at the time. It would have made the 90 minutes a lot easier. But for us to come together at that time, and for me, where football wasn't possible for me, and for, and for Dave Whelan, for, where football wasn't possible for him, to find ourselves in 2013 at Wembley, celebrating a football occasion based on what we'd achieved through the game, just meant the world to me. Because, um, you know, this is something that was totally impossible, could never have been planned for. But happened. And I think the reason why I tell that story is I want to draw the parallel for you because there are a whole host of things that are going to happen with Home Start, within your personal lives, within your professional lives, and you have no idea are going to happen. We talk about goal setting, we can always set goals, but really, we don't know what's down the track. When I talk to kids in schools, I say to them, you know, you're probably going to go into a career that doesn't even exist yet. So, how can you possibly prepare for that? Well, I'll tell you the way you prepare for it. You prepare for the opportunity, okay? Because you don't know what the opportunity is. But if I hadn't done those 10,000 hours, if I hadn't carried on helping the team be successful on the pitch and successful off it in terms of the infrastructure around us, we'd never have made 2012 and we would never have made professional status. You know, if Dave Whelan had given up on his football career and said, I hate the game, it's been nasty to me and, and had the mindset of the sort of negative mindset, he'd have never have found himself winning the FA Cup at Wembley with a football club. So that then comes down to preparing for the opportunity comes down to the choices you make and it comes down to your mindset. And uh, I just draw a short parallel, which is that a lot of you may well have driven today or been driven here today. And um, have you ever let someone into a line of traffic and they don't thank you? Because <laughs> the emotions around the room, a mixture of anger, frustration, how rude. But then I tell you that that, that person is actually rushing a sick child to hospital. The last thing they're thinking of is thanking you for letting them in. They're just grateful you did. And of course the mindset changes completely. And the most incredible thing about that mindset is it's your choice. Because you can make up whatever narrative you want around any situation. It's a question of, uh, of what narrative you choose to deliver to yourself that will make your decisions uh, you know, positive or negative. It'll make your choices positive and negative. So your mindset is your choice. And I received a, an email, for, I, I was talking to a, a group of mortgage advisors a few, a few months ago, and I got an email from a lady, and she said to me, you know, um, I, was, I, I go on holiday with my, with my, with my husband and my, and my young child, and I don't really enjoy holidays very much, because they're mucking about in the pool all the time, and I can't swim. So I decided I'd try and learn to swim. And, um, and I was rubbish at it, and I just could not do it. And I was halfway across my first width, and I was floundering, and I thought to myself, I'm going to give up. And then she said, and I remembered you speaking to us the other day. And I thought, no, I'm not giving up on this. I'm going to make a positive choice. I'm going to say that I can do it, 
and I'm going to achieve it. And you know, she made the other side. And she was so elated in making the other side, she finished the swimming lesson doing four widths. And she took the time to write to me, and it was lovely, and there was definitely a tear in my eye, for sure, because she said, you know what, we're going on holiday next week, and it's going to be amazing, because I can actually play in the pool with, with my child. And so she'd lifted those restrictions on herself. You know, it was absolutely possible, but she told herself it wasn't. And just that little trigger from what I told her and the story I told her was enabled her to go and achieve amazing things. So the question I'm going to sort of leave you with, really, and it's sort of a phrase in a negative way, which is, why would you not want to be the best person you can be? Why would you not want to be the best wife, husband, partner, colleague, uh, trustee, uh, whatever it happens to be you do in life? Why would you want to not only sell yourself short of what you're able to do, but why would you want to leave everyone else short as well? And so when you're making those choices, please take that positive mindset, please take some really positive choices, and you will find that if you prepare for the opportunity, the opportunity will most certainly arise. Thank you.